time um, beyond that into the 1600s then became <clears throat> whether you had church time or you had sort of merchant merchants time because if you employed people you paid them by the hour and you controlled literally everything they did inside that time so that when factories came it was quite normal for people to literally forget to lose all sense of time inside and not be fed at normal meal times to be fed when the bosses told them and it's considered that the old idea of giving somebody a watch when they retired was purely because you gave them their time back. When they worked for you, you bought their time off them and they, they literally had no say in it. So that you could make people work shifts, you could make people work any time of the day. You paid them, you bought their time off them and that was it. Any regulation apart from what you gave them was purely arbitrary. So, you know, this sort of time was a problem to be synchronized across a nation like we do with the <clears throat> with the pips on radio now and on TV, where we can all see a clock and check our watch by. Notice in the story of Don, he has to go down and look at the big clock in the hall of the hotel to put his watch right, which is what people would have done every day because they weren't very, well, most people's watches would have lost a few minutes every day. So to have this idea of an absolute sense of time is something which is quite a modern concept. You know, certainly it wouldn't have mattered to, to people at all. I always remember um, <coughs> Terry Jones talking about the the miners in uh, the uh, the tin miners in Cornwall who used to work until they earned enough money, and then go off on holiday until they spent it all. And this is in the 14th century. We we think that you know that they literally worked like slaves. Well, they didn't. They didn't have a concept like that. They, they didn't have a concept of banking either. So they didn't save money. They worked until they had it, and then they spent it until they didn't have any, and then they went back to work again. Uh, it's very logical. It's very logical. And it also means that in the, <coughs> the agricultural year, um, <coughs> and with saints' days, he actually worked out that most people worked less time in the Middle Ages than they do nowadays. Because in the winter, you wouldn't do very much, because there's nothing much to do. In the summer, you would work extremely hard from dawn till, till dusk. But in the winter, he did very, very little at all because there was nothing to do. You know, the farm needed nothing. And, you know, you didn't have the equipment to do much uh, with moving in weather like this, down tools. Right. <clears throat> so, we're, we're trying talking about what the sort of description of what uh, Dunn was saying. The, 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 the diagram he puts in it is the fact that he says, you've got to imagine that time is going along like this. These are events which are happening on a regular basis, so to speak. And you can think of these as days or moments or anything that's happening on a regular basis. And we have this concept that there's a now, like this. And we can predict them into the future to some degree. But there's a distinct difference between this now, actually, we know what is likely to go on. Sorry, I should have actually dotted that a bit more here. So that's a little bit more hazy. It's getting more and more hazy as we go into the future. So it's noticeable that um, we've just come back from Paris and we had a look at the weather forecast for Paris before we went. And it was very certain for what was going to happen the day after, but it got less and less certain. And it actually tells you the percentage of certainty as it gets further and further away from you. So that sort of follows on. We know the past that we think. We've got this conception of now. Now he's saying, <clears throat> this is what it is in our ordinary everyday life. We have this, pr pr this presence here, this moving presence of, of now. Um, time only seems to move for us in that way. But strangely enough, in sleep, in dreams, we dissolve that. And what seems to happen, or what happens to him from his logs, we're getting influences coming from the recent past and he records as many as are happening from the soon to be recent future. What he's saying is that in his dreams he's got a wider consciousness is the way he described it. Now he doesn't use the word consciousness, he uses the words observer. One of the things that really caught my attention was that this guy was writing 1927. All the thinking guys at the time when the book came out, 
paid attention to it. And for the next five, seven years, it was the talk of the town. His theories were discussed a lot at the top level. Most artists and writers seem to have taken him on board and had a read of his stuff and said, well, he's, you know, he's describing something fishy going on here about human nature. And they all had a go at this sort of thing. And as I say, it was a strong influence on Bert Norton, you know, time present and time past are both contained in time future, etc. They're talking about this fact that you can exhibit, experience the different, the echoes of different things, past and future, in any given present moment. 1927, he does this. The, <clears throat> the guy that sort of all. <laughs> That we, that we all, they referenced to Eugene Halliday would have been 17 at this time. I think he distinctly read this book because of the use of the word of the observer and the way that Dunn uses that word, and the way he bends over backwards not to be, shall we say, spiritual or religious in any sense. He doesn't move into that. In his later books, I think he maybe does. He's moving towards that at the end of the book because he's sort of saying the fact that um, he creates a fact that because this consciousness is able to loosen its grip and to be able to see things in that sense, then that there is an observer at this point here. So he then comes to the state that there's two of us at first. And then he goes, no, there must be more than that. He can extrapolate on this. But he's actually saying there is a sense of time outside of time because this thing is outside of what it's looking at. It's not here, involved in that, it's able to spread its view in sleep. And he suggests the fact that it's bigger than just that present moment, that present moving <coughs> arrow of time. Eugene recommends that very exercise for dream recall that you just described. He does. On his, uh, his tape dreams. Ah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more in-depth. Yeah. But it was that sort of the word, basically. Yes. With a lot more. And later on, I'm, uh, you know, I'll find the, the point for you, but he actually refers to, to what I consider to be the observer point as not the observer, which is the, if you like, the, the crest jewel of, of, of what Eugene teaches us. The fact that you can distinguish. <clears throat> when I, the thing that prompted me to do this talk now is that I think it comes directly from the one we did on the Bardo, because if you remember the... the the bar that we've got, um, let's see, what's the diagram I wanted to, to do from this? It's a simple one in the sense that we describe um, the absolute as being the free zone, and if you put the reality inside here, you have zones, bardos, or intermediary states between them. Uh, you know, we call, we call them the, the Chikai and the, the Sidpa. You're getting closer and closer to reality as you come through these um, uh, you come closer and closer through these levels of, of being from the pure white light which, uh, which the um, Tibetan book talks of uh, at the instant of death you then start to move through dreamlike states becoming more and more real, more and more intense until you come into, back into everyday life again, to, into rebirth. Those states are exactly the same sort of descriptions which um, Eugene refers to that they have in, in yoga. What, what um, Dunn is talking about, although he doesn't obviously know this, is talking about exactly the same sense, only saying that because in sleep we are loosened here, we are become aware of these states, these emotionally charged states. And these things are merged states. He uses that word merged. They're merged states of past, present and future. And they're intermingled in our dreams. And what your problem is in sorting through your dream is unpicking them, like trying to find out which is from the past, which is from the future, and what sort of tone that they've got. You know, to un un unsever, to, to disengage that so that you can unread them, if you like, or, sorry, um, read them by unpicking them. So he's describing